We're here today with Rachel Kadish, who is the author most recently of the book Weight of Ink, which came out last June and tells the story of two women uh, alternating between 1660s London and today. And it is our book club pick for this June. So we're really excited to speak with um, Rachel today and hear a little bit about her process for writing the book and history and women and writing and all those things that we love so much. So um, Rachel, could you start by telling us a little bit about the genesis for this book, um, how you came up with the idea and how you set about researching and writing it? Sure, I'm delighted to. And thank you so much for having me and having this conversation. So I tend to start writing when something is bothering me and I don't know exactly what to make of it. And I tend to figure that out by just making stories. So um, a, a bunch of years ago, there were a couple things kind of bugging me. And one of them uh, was this question that was raised by Virginia Woolf. Um, and she posed a question uh, like so. She said, what if William Shakespeare had had an equally talented sister? What would have been the fate of that woman? And Woolf answered her own question. Um, she said, um, she said, Alas, she died young. She never wrote a word. And you can't argue that that is the most likely fate for a woman with a capacious intelligence and talent in that era. I wasn't arguing, I, I wasn't thinking that's not right. I was thinking, what if, what if, isn't there a way? What if a woman really fought hard and things lined up right? Is there a way that she could have not died without writing a word? So I was kind of shadow boxing. And, um, you know, because it's, of course, it's not just a, an academic question. It's not just theoretical. We all know women who have not been able to express or achieve what, um, really to, to, to put out into the world what they had in them to give because of their gender. So I, um, I thought, let me, um, let me write a historical novel because I love historical novels when they're done well. You get that double bonus of good novel plus you get to walk in another world with this sort of privilege. And um, I thought, let me write a historical novel that'll look back in time to answer this question of what does it take for a woman not to be defeated when everything around her is telling her to you know, sit down and mind her manners. So I knew I was going to try to create characters who didn't mind their manners, and that's awesome. That's fun. Um, but I went looking for a time period, and I had this amazing opportunity to do a, a quarter at Stanford University, and I asked I, as a fellowship. And I asked for a chance to sit in on history classes. So basically I went shopping for a time period. And I started getting fascinated by the 17th century Jewish community of Amsterdam. And I had known nothing about this history at all. I didn't know that Amsterdam's Jews were uh, mostly uh, Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition refugees. I didn't know that that community had excommunica excommunicated Spinoza. I didn't know that Spinoza was Jewish. I didn't know anything about him. Um, but what happened as I was reading is I stumbled across Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein's account of uh, Spinoza's excommunication. And you can read these documents online. It's amazing what's, what's available now. And um, it turned out that excommunication in that community up until that time was a real slap on the wrist kind of thing. It wasn't a big scary thing, it sounds like. It was you're excommunicated until you say you're sorry. You're excommunicated for three weeks, don't do it again. Until Spinoza. And then they gave him this absolute fire and brimstone uh, um, excommunication. Apparently they had to go, I think they had to go to the Catholic Church to find the language for it because Judaism didn't even have a language for that kind of excommunication. And it's, you know, God's fury will smoke against him. And I, I read this and it's a 350 year old document you can hear the fear in it. Like, oh my God, okay, these people are terrified. It clicked for me. I thought, okay, they're refugees. They're Portuguese Inquisition refugees. They've survived everything they've survived. They finally found this perch of safety in Amsterdam. And here's this guy messing it up for them because you were allowed to be openly Jewish in Amsterdam. It was safe, which was such a rarity. But one of the few things you were not allowed to do was discuss atheism and debate religion with non-Jews. So their whole excommunication ban reels reads like, that guy, he's not us, we're not with him, you know, he's over there, we're over here. And um, as soon as I, I heard their fear in that, I thought, oh, I know these people. Because I grew up around refugees. I grew up, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. My mother was born on the farm. 
And there was something about that refugee mentality, the, the fierce determination to rebuild and this, the fear and the brittleness, the sense that things could fall apart at any moment. I thought this is my community. So I, um, I thought that uh, there would be a um, young Jewish woman who'd grown up in this community. She would be asked to scribe for a blind rabbi. He slides into the Inquisition, so he needs someone to read and write for him. She would actually go with him to London um, as part of this mission to re-educate the Jews of London. And her brother is supposed to scribe, but when that doesn't work out for various reasons, she's given a job the way they do, the way they let women do things on the frontiers, you know, when there isn't a guy who has the skills to do it. So, you know, for now, honey, you can do it. And that started me. Um, I just started writing her voice. And then I started writing the voice of Helen Watt, who is this this non-Jewish British historian uh, in contemporary times who finds the document that Esther scribed and thought. So were there any historical figures who were analogous to your main character or did you invent her whole cloth? I invented her whole cloth, but, <laughs> but I'm not convinced that someone couldn't have done what she did. And I was super careful about the research. I mean, that was ridiculous, honestly. I was very meticulous. Um, you know, I'm sure I made some errors, but I was really careful of researching everything from 17th century sanitation, medicine. Um, when I was writing the 17th century language, I would look up the first known use of words in Merriam-Webster to make sure that the word I was having them speak was actually a word they would have known. So if, uh, if the word chaperone um, didn't come into the language till 1720, and my characters are in the 1660s, I wouldn't have them say that. I have them say companion or duenna, which was a word from 80 years earlier. So I was super careful, um, spent a lot of time in rare manuscript rooms and all of that. And the reason I was so careful is I thought, when I finish writing this, if I ever finish writing this, because it took a really long time, and sometimes I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to finish. Um, but I thought, if I ever finish writing this, somebody's going to say to me, well, okay, um, Esther Velasquez, you know, nice story, but clearly this is fictitious. And we know that no woman wrote, managed to write philosophy in the 17th century because we know there are only about six women who managed to, whose writings we have from that era. And well, a couple wrote a little bit of philosophy, but not much, and here's who they were. And they were all nobility, pretty much childless, wealthy, certainly not Jewish. So clearly it didn't happen. And what I wanted to be able to say was this, that Esther Velasquez is fictitious, but everything about her story is plausible. And I see no reason that someone might not have done this. I think that um, if you look at, if you look back in history, there have always been people who tried to express what was in them, sing their song despite restrictions. Just because something was against the rules doesn't mean people weren't trying to do it. People try to do what the grass does. They try to grow up to a pavement. And most don't succeed, but some do. Some do despite the restrictions on education or access or things like that. But if there were a woman who um, did what Esther does, who found a way through subterfuge to manage to live a life of the mind, she would have had to do it under a man's name. So if somebody did it and succeeded, we would never know about it. So how do we know? You know, we know now that um, a lot of the music that we thought was by Felix Mendelssohn is actually by his sister Fanny and was written and published under his name. So um, I was careful with research because I wanted to be able to say Esther's fictitious, but somebody might have done this. Yeah, it's really interesting for me to hear you talk about this because I'm actually taking a class right now on 17th century literature and we're learning, I'm in an MFA program and um, while also working part-time at JWA. And we're learning about how, you know, the various ways that women sort of worked either outside the system or within the system to get their words out there, whether, as you said, by, you know, assuming a man's name or translating a man's work when in reality it was their own work or by saying, oh, I'm just writing a cookbook and actually, you know, sneaking poetry into the cookbook. Um, so it's, it's interesting to hear your conception of how you created a character that, you know, whose life was quite realistic while working within the strictures of that time. So one thing that I was curious to hear about um, is your choice to write these braided narratives of the modern day researcher and the historical figure. Um, I know that, you know, we see this a lot in books like Possession and The Historian. So what do you think is the advantage of presenting these two stories as opposed to just writing straight historical fiction with no modern component? 
always love that structure when it's done well, but mm -hmm. it's also because, I mean, I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes if I'm reading a braided narrative, there's just one storyline that feels stronger than the other. And I feel like every time the, the writer asks me to switch perspectives, I feel like I have to drag myself over that threshold. So it's risky in that sense. Um, but it also feels very intuitive to me. Um, I grew up around so much, we all grew up around a lot of history. We all grew up swimming in history. For me, I grew up around relatives who, um, whose history was very different from what I was living in, my, uh, my mother's family. So uh, it would be, you know, we're sitting at the dinner table and people are saying, you know, yes, well, that's when we were in Russian prison, past the salt. Um, the idea that, um, that history would pop up in the middle of your daily life and you'd have to decide whether to engage with it is both very normal to me and also fascinating. And I like alternating back and forth for me because I didn't outline in advance. I, and I usually don't outline in advance. I, I have specific reasons I can't. Um, it was, I wrote it in the order in which you read it. So I would genuinely be um, in the contemporary storyline and they would find something with the uh, catchphrase uh, doodled in the margins. And they would say, how would someone in the 17th century have known this phrase? And I would be thinking, I don't know, how does Esther know this phrase? And then I'd go to the 17th century and I would write a chapter to kind of figure that out um, and back and forth that way. And I enjoyed it. That's so interesting. So you find that you can't outline when you write, even for such a long book. Yes. And I know that doesn't make any sense. It's a terrible way to write a novel. I don't recommend it. <laughs> but the only way that I can figure out to do it because I think the way I um, weave a plot, um, and I mean that in both ways, the way I think about plot and the way I create plot um, has to do very deeply with character. So it's like an equation, the character plus pressures that people are under um, equals plot. So you can't figure out what happens until you know who your people are and what pressures they're under. So if you and I, two different people, um, you could put the two of us under the exact same pressure and we would respond in different ways. Um, and so I have to figure out before I know what the people do, I have to figure out, spend some time figuring out who my characters are, what are the circumstances of their lives. And um, I know with Helen, just even figuring out in the beginning, um, I always thought she would have a hand tremor. I realized later that the reason I'd done that was because I've always loved the line, um, if I forget the O Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand or my, or my right hand lose my cunning is how it's translated. And um, somehow the image of this historian who all she wants, um, metaphorically, but also literally, is to touch history. And what did she touch? Is touch these documents. They're too fragile. She can't handle them. Um, that image stayed in my head. So once that was there, well, that's a character and she's under that set of pressures. So what's she going to do? How is she going to handle the, um, the indignity of that? Uh, well, and, and how is she going to get the help she needs? Well, then she has to hire Aaron, and he's arrogant. And this arrogant young guy comes in there, and he reminds her of this guy she used to know. That's another pressure. How is she going to respond? And then how is he going to respond to how she treats him? And the, the plot forms from there. And so, um, you know, I develop the characters. I watch them. So there's a character named Rivka who is... In theory, a minor character. She's the housekeeper in the household, but she became fascinating to me the more I worked with her until she became um, pivotal to the story. And that only happened because I was watching her. I, I write like I'm a short person at a party and I can't see the whole room. Everybody's taller than me. I'm just sort of, I can see the face of the person I'm talking to. I can follow one person around. And then eventually I get, I understand the shape of the whole room. So I followed Rivka and then suddenly she became a pivotal character. So I, that's how I work. And then I have, and that's a big mess and I have to clean it up later and make it all look like I did it on purpose and you know, like it was outlined from the start. I was also interested um, that you said that your book took, I think you said 10 years to write. Is that correct? Uh, actually 12. But it's 12 years. Wow. Yeah, 12. Um, so did you find that that was different from your other novels and were people surprised? I know I always find that people say, oh, you know, it should take you two years or one year to write a book and then they might be surprised if it takes longer or shorter and I mean does it depend on the project and the person do you think yeah there, there was a lot of uh how's your book going is, is this the same book you were working on four years ago <laughs> yes, it's the same book. 
but there are a couple reasons it took so long. Um, one, I mean, it's, it's a big book, it's a long book, but also the research was intense. So it was like writing two novels. It was, um, I researched, my research process was intertwined with the writing. It's not like I took four years to research and then, you know, eight years to write or something. Um, but still, it took a lot of time. And also I had young kids. And um, if, you, if you look at the acknowledgements, acknowledgements in my book, I, mean, I thank all the babysitters. I thank the other parents who took my kids sometimes when things were needed. You know, I mean, it's, um, it's important to acknowledge. I'm writing about the realities of women's lives and how women in the ship persist. And um, the difficulties of writing as a woman in the 21st century are so much less than in the 17th century that I can't complain, but it does slow down the process. Um, so I had young kids and I was doing this very um, big project. And there were times, remember when V.S. Naipaul came out with that statement about how, uh, you know, so um, V.S. Naipaul, Nobel, Nobel Prize winning writer, came out with a statement about how a woman writer will never be the equal of a man and all of this. And it was a big, big thing. I think he enjoyed the controversy very much. And around that time, um, one of my kids, who's fortunately fine now, but was then having some, um, some GI problems. And I remember I was, I was like driving a stool sample around <laughs> to get it to the doctors. Um, am, I the, am I the first person you've interviewed to bring poop into the conversation? Because I'm very proud of that yourself. I think, I think you might be actually. <laughs> All right, so congratulations. <laughs> Um, but that's, you know, again, it's, it's, I was driving this around town. I'm thinking, B.S. Naipaul's not doing this right now. You know, he's working on his next book. And during that time, there was a, a quote by John Gardner that was in my head a lot. It was, um, he said, a novel should be a vivid and continuous dream. And I remember thinking, how am I supposed to have a vivid and continuous dream when there's ear infections and snow days and, you know, I got kids in preschool. And, and then suddenly it was like the light bulb went off and I thought, oh, the vivid and continuous dream is not for me, it's for the reader. And as crazy as my life gets, I need to just not stop. I just need to come back to it and come back to it and eventually build this vivid and continuous dream for the reader. And if I'm writing about a 17th century character who didn't, um, who didn't give up, I need to get over my own you know, <laughs> self-pity over the 3,000th snow day and just keep going. Yeah, you know, this seems to be a sort of an ongoing fake controversy whether women can be as good writers as men if they have children and motherhood um but you said you enjoyed reading about that controversy and hearing about that controversy do you still think that there's a lot to say about that or should we kind of let that conversation go in the year 2018 you know i think it's a conversation that we should have let go a long time ago um yet it's still going on and so it gets under our skin sure so one thing that um, I did also think about was that I was accepting that frame that had been handed to me. Can women do what the guys do? Can we get up to the level of, you know, V.S. Naipaul or whoever? And I thought, that's not even the right frame. Of, of course we can. The, questions, the question is just, what, um, what in my circumstances, a writer is always, any artist is always taking in what's around them and using it as raw material for what they can do. And I think, um, although I don't happen to write about children, it's, it's not something, I don't have anything against doing that, it's just not something I've really done yet. But I think that all those years I spent reading middle grade and YA books uh, to and with my kids and alongside my kids taught me something that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise, which is, um, I think it's very easy for us to forget in our very, in our literary sophistication, it is easy for us to forget that plot matters, that you've got to tell a good story. And one thing that you have to do when you're writing books for kids is you have to tell a good story. You can't, um, you know, you can't go for long pages and pages of description where nothing happens. And it was really good to have that reminder. And I think that was a positive influence um, when I was writing this book. And I thought, you know what? I want to write a good story. I'm, I'm going to let this book have a good plot. I love that. That's so interesting to hear that you um, that you got that through reading to your kids. Like, I, I don't have kids, but I find that sometimes I just want to read a YA novel, just burn through it in a night, and you can't put it down. And it is really instructional, I think, to bring those tools 
to more literary fiction as well. They are brilliant at plot. They're good YA and middle school titles. Love them. <laughs> what were some of your favorite YA titles that you read with your kids or that you read now? Uh, well, um, I've, um, I, you know, I've read a lot of the, the usual, you know, the Harry Potters and Rick Riordan and all of that and you know, big Tolkien buffs, but I'm going to, since you asked me and I get to get up on a soapbox, I'm going to name one that no one has heard of and everybody should have heard of. It's uh, by Jane Langdon and it's called The Diamond in the Window. And she is, I think she must be in her 90s now. She's a local writer and it is set in Conquer, the Concord area, the Massachusetts area, and it, it's a mystery that um, uses local history. So Louisa May Alcott and Thoreau and Emerson and all of this, um, and they are, um, their writings are intertwined with this amazing kid mystery. And so it's just, it's so good, and it's out of print. If I can, uh, I don't know, if I can do one thing, I, I want to see if I could get it back into print. It's so, so good, The Diamond in the Window. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, to circle back to talking about history, I know that we've talked about this a lot already and we sort of already covered this question, but I want to make sure to get your take on it. Um, you know, we're all about studying history here at JWA and I'm wondering what you personally find empowering about studying history. I think Studying history makes me feel more sane when I look at the craziness in our current world. I think it's helpful to know that other people have been in uh, difficult situations and to, to learn from how they've resolved them. It's helpful to see the variety of things people have faced and just to know that um, we're, not, we're not unique. And I mean that both in the ego deflating way, we are not unique. Uh, in facing big challenges and also uh, it's a sort of strength. Um, but I think also I just, how can you understand the people around you if you don't understand your history? How can you, um, how can you even know what you're looking at if you don't know where it came from? I mean that in the shorter term, you know, how can I understand my, my, my grandfather um, died uh, many years ago, but he was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. If I don't know something about that, then how do I understand this man who, you know, was a big part of my life, who was born in 1904? And, you know, um, and I also mean, you know, in the big sense, we're living here, I'm living in this house in New England. If I don't understand what shaped this community, how do I understand what I see happening when I walk down the street? And now finally, can you tell us a bit about what's next for you? What projects you have coming up? Do you know what your next book will be? I know some authors don't like to talk about it, so that's fine, but anything you can tell us would be great. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I've, I've been writing some essays, so there's that. I have, I have some ideas, but it's because I don't outline in advance, I can never figure out what is or isn't going to bear fruit until I start sketching in a notebook and trying to figure out where the thing does or doesn't want to go. And I just, I've been, I've been traveling a lot with the book, which is wonderful. Um, I'm very, very fortunate. I've met just really wonderful people through this book. And I have um, my son who, I was pregnant with him when I started the book. He's about to have his bar mitzvah. So again, there's, that's how long this, this took. So um, I'm hoping that after that I'll be able to sit down then I'll have a better answer to that question if you ask me maybe in a few months. Great. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add or anything else that you want the JWA audience to know that we didn't touch on? First of all, how fortified it is to know that there are organizations out there, um, that you guys are out there preserving this history and helping people explore this history. It is so... Um, it's not something to ever take for granted. Um, and I feel like in the arts world, we can, uh, we can present ourselves. There, there's so many times we have to present ourselves in different ways, you know, as purely an artist or someone working on Jewish themes or someone working on women's themes. And there are only a, a very few organizations where, um, <clears throat> a few organizations where I can say, this is the, the full breadth of what I'm interested in. And, um, and you guys can that's exactly what we what we do, and we're you know we're interested in that. So um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that um, 
they're there for, I was going to say for our daughters, but it's our sons too, to, to know this, this history. Um, and then the other thing is just that I'm really grateful for, um, for people who are willing to jump into, into this history, not, not even the specific 17th century, you know, Jewish women's Sephardic history, but just to jump into hip history with depth and interest right now is a powerful and important thing because our public culture right now really encourages us to think in 140 characters or 280 characters and to not experience any emotion deeper than outrage. And I feel like to step into a historical novel is, um, is to, to really take on going in the opposite direction, to be willing to experience a time different than ours and to feel things in, with some depth. And so I'm just um, I'm grateful and, and grateful to you all for taking the time.